Welcome to CT Small Business Toolkit, where small business innovators and influencers share the advice that will help you turn your idea into a business and your business into a success. Let's get started. Our guest this week on CT Small Business Toolkit is M. Tamara Chandler. She is the CEO at People Firm and the author of the new book, How Performance Management is Killing Performance and What to Do About It. And Tamara, thanks very much for being with us. Oh, thank you so much. Let's start with the bad news in that title. The traditional performance <laughs> review, of course, usually consists of bosses going over the highs and lows of an employee's year and discussing what went right, what went wrong, maybe a little bit of a look ahead to the year to come. Why does that stifle performance rather than inspire it by going over the record like that? Early on, I was asked to prove that we can connect performance management to actually driving performance. And what we found was that more often than not, that whole process where you bring people in and you go through the review and the do, you, you try to engage in a healthy conversation ends up in something that's really not a very healthy conversation. And part of the reason is we've bundled all the things we're trying to do with performance management into sort of one event. We're trying to develop people. We're trying to determine rewards and equitability and rewards. And we're trying to connect people to the organization and performance and what we're doing. And by bundling it all in that, we tend to sort of lose some of the really valuable pieces like the development and the focus. And we tend to get very... uh, into just trying to determine a number or a rating in order to drive a compensation decision or to um, have an, have a downstream impact on other decisions. And so we sort of lose the human, we lose the, the person in it, and we're not really having a really authentic conversation about the great work you're doing and how you can do more of that and how that work connects to the strategy and the tent of the organization. So in the book, I talk about eight fatal flaws, and it looks at how a lot of the core assumptions we've been running with, frankly, just don't hold up when we look at research and science about human behavior and human motivation. And then we can kind of break it down and look at the unhealthiness of the conversation, the competition we're creating, the focus too much on the past versus the future, the lack of transparency we have in the process for our people, which drives a lack of trust. And all those same things, unfortunately, tend to drive disengagement, which actually lowers our performance rather than increasing our performance. So with all the best intentions, we often tend to have the, the, uh, an outcome that's actually opposite of the outcome we're seeking. Transparency and collaboration seem to be some of the big things you're encouraging folks to pursue here rather than letting folks in on this is what you need to know. Well, you just will worry about the rest of it. Uh, Letting people in on the bigger concepts of what the the company is after, uh, encouraging many more voices to the table. How radical of a shift is that for most businesses and, and to what extent are most of them adopting it these days? It is a it's a radical shift, predominantly because it is questioning so many of the habits and the behaviors that we've had in business for centuries. Um, you can look at traditional performance management. It goes back to the, the real roots of it, go back to the industrial era. And in that, we made a lot of assumptions in which we built this process and these mechanisms. And we've automated it, so we sort of automated the process over the past many years, but we frankly haven't automated a good process. Um, so we need to, as you said, look at collaboration and transparency and bring those things in. And this is this is a huge shift in how we behave and how we perform and how we talk and how we engage with our people. And it really makes us uncomfortable. So it's a big shift. What we're finding is a lot of organizations are talking about it. Still, are, there, there's a, and there's a, uh, you know, we see uh, commentary and publications about those people that are moving forward. But it's still a small percentage so far like maybe under 6% who have made any radical change in performance match. We're talking with M. uh, Tamara Chandler. The book is How Performance Management is Killing Performance and What to Do About It. And following the eight fatal flaws, you have the eight fundamental shifts, which talk a lot about what we've just referenced here, uh, lack of uh, control and, 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 and that sort of thing and transparency and collaboration. Fundamental shift number eight might surprise even people who are generally on board with what you're talking about here. It says shift from paying for performance and shift to uh, paying for capabilities and rewarding for contributions. The idea of not paying based on performance is going to catch a lot of people by surprise. Uh, so elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, you picked one of the real meaty shifts. When we look at how we are determining pay for our people, we frequently are 
bundling too many things together. We're trying to understand how their capabilities, their skills map to the market and what those are worth in the market. And then we're also trying to reward and recognize those people who are really driving the performance, who are having the biggest impact within the company. And unfortunately, we too often put those together in this thing we call merit. And pretty soon we get pretty confused over what is capability pay? That means I can do this job at this level. And if I want to get higher pay as capability pay, I need to build my skills versus contribution pay that says, wow, you really delivered something. You had an impact in the organization that helped move the needle for us as a total company. And we need to separate those out. And it will help us so much as people leaders and business leaders to understand um, how we pay people and how we reward equitably and really be able to truly meet what we say when we say, you know, pay for performance, really be able to recognize those people who are having a difference and not blend it too much and end up with a, you know, a, your high performers or a 3% increase in your moderate performers or 2.5. When you look at the real numbers of that, it isn't anything significant. But yet I hear all business leaders saying, no, I really want to recognize my top performers. I want to want to be able to show them that their contributions are meaningful. So in order to do that, we need to start to separate that capability pay from that reward and contribution pay. Tamara, going back to the collaboration aspect of this and kind of transitioning from the old model into the new model, obviously more voices at the table, more people in on what the bigger goals are, people working as a team rather than necessarily competing against each other, although there's likely to be some of that innately, even if the structure's not like that. Um, how do you still maintain some sort of flow chart, though. Obviously, ultimately, somebody's responsible for what happens and so forth. So how do you structure it so that everybody knows they're valued, everybody knows that they're uh, uh, an important part of this team, but ultimately, I'm making the decisions? Right. That's a really great question. And there's a lot bundled in that question. First and foremost, we need to help our people understand what, what great looks like. So it, even going back to the conversation I just had about capability and contribution pay, the more we can help our, our teams understand this is what the expectations are for the roles and start to share success profiles for roles and help our employees understand, hey, here's how I really build my capabilities and skills and what's expected. And then further, if we can say this is what contribution looks like and define that and as, as much as possible make that measurable, then we can take a lot of the bias and the, the influence that any one individual might have. Then secondly, as you said, I really stress how do you bring more voices to the table? Because here's the fact. This is a human process. In the end, a manager, a leader, a business owner is going to have to make a decision. But the way that you can improve the quality of that decision is by bringing more people into the conversation, by engaging them in uh, a dialogue about what does great look like and how have these people shown up and let's look at it compared to what we've said our expectations are. And as you bring more people to that, you're going to make better decisions. And ultimately, yes, someone has to make a decision, but what you're trying to do is make the best decision you can and recognize that we are all still human. We all have biases. We're going to bring that to the table, but the more we can be authentic in it, the better outcomes we'll have. Tamara, just a minute or so left in our conversation here, and there's so much more in this book that folks should take a look at. Again, it's how performance management is killing performance and what to do about it. So I'd, I'd actually hope to squeeze two questions in here real quickly. But first, much of our audience is uh, sm very small businesses, just a few employees, some a little bit larger, but certainly in the small business realm. Uh, how do these principles change a little bit when you're only talking about a, a small number of people rather than teams in various areas of a company? My organization is about 60 people, and we apply all these principles in what we do. I think the lovely thing about being a smaller organization is you can really think about how your culture and your values are going to show up in the way you want to recognize and engage your teams. And particularly for smaller organizations, you may really look at more team-based metrics. How does everyone succeed when the organization succeeds, and how do you connect them to what that success looks like? And finally, much of this book, after identifying the problem and, and, and kind of painting the picture of what a more effective uh, communications and collaborative environment looks like in a business, you, you lay out the steps to get there. And that's a, a big chunk of the book. So if somebody is reading this and understanding it, they still might come to the conclusion, man, that's going to take a lot of work. I can do <laughs> some of this. I don't know if I can do all of this. Uh, it's almost overwhelming to even try to start down this road. So what do you tell them? The reason I wrote the book and put all that how-to in there, and you're right, it is a step-by-step -step guide to doing this, is I was inspired to help other people solve this problem. 
performance management is frankly unilaterally hated by almost everybody. So let's <laughs> fix it and let's work on that together. So the, the steps are in there where, uh, and, and hopefully a lot of people can pick it up and run. But I agree, it's a lot to take on. We're certainly here to help and can help people take that forward. And we can also make sure that um, uh, we, we've got the PM Reboot on LinkedIn if people want to talk. We've got a lot of references and sources that people can go to to help. Fascinating stuff. Tamara, congratulations on the book. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. M. Tamara Chandler is the CEO at People Firm. The book is How Performance Management is Killing Performance and What to Do About It. I'm Greg Corumbus reporting for CT Small Business Toolkit. Thanks for joining us on CT Small Business Toolkit. Be sure to visit our website, ct.walterskluwer.com, and follow at CT Corporation on Twitter. We'll see you next time on CT Small Business Toolkit.